सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ सोशल साइंस फॉर क्लास एट एंटाइटल्ड आर पास्ट थ्री टेक्स्ट बुक इन हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास एट दिस इज लेसन थ्री रूलिंग द कंट्री साइड फ्रॉम पेज ट्वेंटी सिक्स टू पेज थर्टी एट लेट्स लिसन टू द लेसन थ्री पेज ट्वेंटी सिक्स द कंपनी बिकम्स द दिवान ऑन ट्वेल्व ऑगस्ट सेवनटीन सिक्सटी फाइव द मुगल एम्पर अपॉइंटेड द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी एज द दिवान ऑफ बेंगाल द एक्चुअल इवेंट मोस्ट प्रॉबली टुक प्लेस इन रॉबर्ट क्लाइव स्टेंट विद a few englishmen and indians as witnesses but in the painting above the event is shown as a majestic occasion taking place in a grand setting the painter was commissioned by clive to recall the memorable events in clive's life the grant of diwani clearly was one such event in british imagination as diwan the company became the chief financial administrator of the territory under its control now it had to think of administering the land and organizing its revenue resources this had to be done in a way that could yield enough revenue to meet the growing expenses of the company a trading company had also to ensure that it could buy the products it needed and sell what it wanted figure 1 robert clive accepting the diwani of bengal bihar and orissa from the mughal ruler in 1765 page 27 over the years the company also learned that it had to move with some caution being an alien power it needed to pacify those who in the past had ruled the countryside and enjoyed authority and prestige those who had held local power had to be controlled but they could not be entirely eliminated how was this to be done in this chapter we will see how the company came to colonize the countryside organize revenue resources redefine the rights of people and produce the crops it wanted revenue for the company the company had become the diwan but it still saw itself primarily as a trader it wanted a large revenue income but was unwilling to set up any regular system of assessment and collection the effort was to increase the revenue as much as it could and buy fine cotton and silk cloth as cheaply as possible within 5 years the value of goods bought by the company in bengal doubled before 1865 the company had purchased goods in india by importing gold and silver from britain now the revenue collected in bengal could finance the purchase of goods for export soon it was clear that the bengal economy was facing a deep crisis artisans were deserting villages since they were being forced to sell their goods to the company at low prices peasants were unable to pay the dues that were being demanded from them artisanal production was in decline and agricultural cultivation showed signs of collapse then in 1770 a terrible famine killed 10 million people in bengal about one third of the population was wiped out figure 2 a weekly market in murshidabad in bengal peasants and artisans from rural areas regularly came to these weekly markets or hearts to sell their goods and buy what they needed these markets were badly affected during times of economic crisis page 
28. The need to improve agriculture. If the economy was in ruins, could the company be certain of its revenue income? Most company officials began to feel that investment in land had to be encouraged and agriculture had to be improved. How was this to be done? After two decades of debate on the question, the company finally introduced the permanent settlement in 1793. By the terms of the settlement, the Rajas and Talukdars were recognized as Zamindars. They were asked to collect rent from the peasants and pay revenue to the company. The amount to be paid was fixed permanently, that is, it was not to be increased ever in future. It was felt that this would ensure a regular flow of revenue into the company's coffers and at the same time encourage the zamindars to invest in improving the land. Since the revenue demand of the state would not be increased, the zamindar would benefit from increased production from the land. The problem The permanent settlement, however, created problems. Company officials soon discovered that the zamindars were in fact not investing in the improvement of land. The revenue that had been fixed was so high that the zamindars found it difficult to pay. Anyone who failed to pay the revenue lost his zamindari. Numerous zamindaris were sold off at auctions organized by the company. By the first decade, of the 19th century, the situation changed. The prices in the market rose and cultivation slowly expanded. This meant an increase in the income of the zamindars, but no gain for the company since it could not increase a revenue demand that had been fixed permanently. Even then, the zamindars did not have an interest in improving the land. Some had lost their lands in the earlier years of the settlement. Others now saw the possibility of earning without the trouble and risk of investment. As long as the zamindars could give out the land to tenants and get rent, they were not interested in improving the land. Figure 3. Charles Convallis Convallis was the Governor-General of India when the permanent settlement was introduced. Source 1. Colebrook on Bengal Riots In many villages of Bengal, some of the powerful riots did not cultivate, but instead gave out their lands to others, the under-tenants, taking from them very high rents. In 1806, H.T. Colebrook described the conditions of those under tenants in Bengal. The under tenants, depressed by an excessive rent in kind and by usurious returns for the cattle, seed, and sustenance advanced to them, can never extricate themselves from debt. In so abject a state, they cannot labor in spirit while they earn a scanty sustenance without hope of bettering their situation. Activity Why do you think Collarbrook is concerned with the conditions of the under-riots in Bengal? Read the preceding pages and suggest possible reasons. Page 29 On the other hand, in the villages, the cultivator found the system extremely oppressive. The rent he paid to the zamindar was high and his right on the land was insecure. To pay the rent, he had to often take a loan from the money lender and when he failed to pay the rent, he was evicted from the land he had cultivated for generations. A new system is devised. By the early 19th century, many of the company officials were convinced that the system of revenue had to be changed again. How could revenues be fixed permanently at a time when the company needed more money to meet its expenses of administration and trade? 
in the northwestern provinces of the Bengal Presidency, most of this area is now in Uttar Pradesh. An Englishman called Holt Mackenzie devised the new system which came into effect in 1822. He felt that the village was an important social institution in North Indian society and needed to be preserved. Under his directions, collectors went from village to village, inspecting the land, measuring the fields and recording the customs and rights of different groups. The estimated revenue of each plot within a village was added up to calculate the revenue that each village or mehel had to pay. This demand was to be revised periodically, not permanently fixed. The charge of collecting the revenue and paying it to the company was given to the village headman rather than the zamindar. This system came to be known as Mehelwari Settlement. The Munro System In the British territories in the south, there was a similar move away from the idea of permanent settlement. The new system that was devised came to be known as the Ryotwar or Ryotwari. It was tried on a small scale by Captain Alexander Reed in some of the areas that were taken over by the company after the wars with Tipu Sultan. Subsequently developed by Thomas Munro, this system was gradually extended all over South India. Reed and Munro felt that in the South there were no traditional zamindars. The settlement, they argued, had to be made directly with the cultivators or riots who had tilled the land for generations. Their fields had to be carefully and separately surveyed before the revenue assessment was made. Munro thought that the British should act as paternal father figures protecting the riots under the charge. The Meaning of Mehel In British revenue records, Mehel is a revenue estate which may be a village or a group of villages. Figure 4 Thomas Munro, Governor of Madras from 1819 to 1826 Page 30 Activity Imagine that you are a company representative sending a report back to England about the conditions in rural areas under company rule. What would you write? All was not well. Within a few years after the new systems were imposed, it was clear that all was not well with them. Driven by the desire to increase the income from land, revenue officials fixed too high a revenue demand. Peasants were unable to pay. Riots fled the countryside and villages became deserted in many regions. Optimistic officials had imagined that the new system would transform the peasants into rich, enterprising farmers. But this did not happen. Crops for Europe The British also realised that the countryside could not only yield revenue, it could also grow the crops that Europe required. By the late 18th century, the company was trying its best to expand the cultivation of opium and indigo. In the century and a half that followed, the British persuaded or forced cultivators in various parts of India to produce other crops. Jute in Bengal, tea in Assam, sugarcane in the United Provinces, which is now Uttar Pradesh, wheat in Punjab, cotton in Maharashtra and Punjab, rice in Madras. How was this done? The British used a variety of methods to expand the cultivation of crops that they needed. Let us take a closer look at the story of one such crop, one such method of production. Figure 5 A Kalamkari Print 
20th century India. Figure 6. A Morris cotton print. Late 19th century India. Does color have a history? Figure 5 and 6 are two images of cotton prints. The image on the left, which is figure 5, shows a Kalamkari print created by weavers of Andhra Pradesh in India. On the right is a floral cotton print designed and produced by William Morris, a famous poet and artist of 19th century Britain. There is one thing common in the two prints. Both use rich blue colour, commonly called indigo. Page 31 Do you know how this colour was produced? The blue that you see in these prints was produced from a plant called indigo. It is likely that the blue dye used in the Morris prints in 19th century Britain was manufactured from indigo plants cultivated in India. For India was the biggest supplier of indigo in the world at that time. Why the demand for Indian indigo? The indigo plant grows primarily in the tropics. By the 13th century, Indian indigo was being used by cloth manufacturers in Italy, France and Britain to dye cloth. However, only small amounts of Indian indigo reached the European market and its price was very high. European cloth manufacturers therefore had to depend on another plant called wood to make violet and blue dyes. Being a plant of the temperate zones, wood was more easily available in Europe. It was grown in northern Italy, southern France and in parts of Germany and Britain. Worried by the competition from indigo, wood producers in Europe pressurized their governments to ban the import of indigo. Cloth dyers, however, preferred indigo as a dye. Indigo produced a rich blue color, whereas the dye from wood was pale and dull. By the 17th century, European cloth producers persuaded their governments to relax the ban on indigo import. The French began cultivating indigo in St. Dominique, in the Caribbean islands, the Portuguese in Brazil, the English in Jamaica and the Spanish in Venezuela. Indigo plantations also came up in many parts of North America. By the end of the 18th century, the demand for Indian indigo grew further. Britain began to industrialize and its cotton production expanded dramatically creating an enormous new demand for cloth ties. While the demand for indigo increased, its existing supplies from the West Indies and America collapsed for a variety of reasons. Between 1783 and 1789, the production of indigo in the world fell by half. Cloth tires in Britain now desperately looked for new sources of indigo supply. From where could this indigo be procured? Britain turns to India. Faced with the rising demand for indigo in Europe, the company in India looked for ways to expand the area under indigo cultivation. Plantation A large farm operated by a planter employing various forms of forced labour. Plantations are associated with the production of coffee sugarcane, tobacco, tea and cotton. Page 32 From the last decades of the 18th century, indigo cultivation in Bengal expanded rapidly and Bengal indigo came to dominate the world market. In 1788, only about 30% of the indigo imported into Britain was from India. By 1810, the proportion had gone up to 95%. As the indigo trade grew, commercial agents and officials of the company began investing in indigo production. Over the years, many company officials left their jobs to look after their indigo business.
attracted by the prospect of high profits, numerous Scotsmen and Englishmen came to India and became planters. Those who had no money to produce indigo could get loans from the company and the banks that were coming up at the time. How was indigo cultivated? There were two main systems of indigo cultivation, Nij and Ryoti. Within the system of Nij cultivation, the planter produced indigo in lands that he directly controlled. He either bought the land or rented it from other zamindars and produced indigo by directly employing hired labourers. The problem with Nij cultivation The planters found it difficult to expand the area under Nij cultivation. Indigo could be cultivated only on fertile lands and these were all already densely populated. Only small plots scattered over the landscape could be acquired. Planters needed large areas in compact blocks to cultivate indigo in plantations. Where could they get such land from? They attempted to lease in the land around the indigo factory and evict the peasants from the area. But this always led to conflicts and tension. Nor was labour easy to mobilise. A large plantation required a vast number of hands to operate and labour was needed precisely at a time when peasants were usually busy with their rice cultivation. Figure 7 The Slave Revolt in St. Dominique, August 1791 Painting by January Skuhodolsky In the 18th century, French planters produced indigo and sugar in the French colony of St. Dominic in the Caribbean islands. The African slaves who worked on the plantations rose in rebellion in 1791, burning the plantations and killing their rich planters. In 1792, France abolished slavery in the French colonies. These events led to the collapse of the indigo plantations on the Caribbean islands. What does slave mean? A person who is owned by someone else, the slave owner. A slave has no freedom and is compelled to work for the master. Page 33 Niche cultivation on a large scale also required many ploughs and bullocks. One bigha of indigo cultivation required two ploughs. This meant that a planter with thousand bighas would need two thousand ploughs. Investing on purchase and maintenance of ploughs was a big problem. Nor could supplies be easily got from the peasants since their ploughs and bullocks were busy on their rice fields. Again, exactly at the time that the indigo planters needed them. Till the late 19th century, planters were therefore reluctant to expand the area under niche cultivation. Less than 25% of the land producing indigo was under this system. The rest was under an alternative mode of cultivation. The Ryoti system Bigha, a unit of measurement of land. Before the British rule, the size of this area varied. In Bengal, the British standardized it to about one third of an acre. Indigo on the land of riots. Under the Ryoti system, the planters forced the riots to sign a contract, an agreement or satta. At times, they pressurized the village headmen to sign the contract on behalf of the riots. Those who signed the contract got cash advances from the planters at low rates of interest to produce indigo. But the loan committed the riot to cultivating indigo 
on at least 25% of the area under his holding. The planter provided the seed and the drill while the cultivators prepared the soil, sowed the seed and looked after the crop. Figure 8. Workers Harvesting Indigo in Early 19th Century Bengal From Colesworthy Grant, Rural Life in Bengal, 1860 In India, the indigo plant was cut mostly by men. Figure 9 The indigo plant being brought from the fields to the factory. Page 34 How was indigo produced? The indigo villages were usually around indigo factories owned by the planters. After harvest, the indigo plant was taken to the vats in the indigo factory. Three or four vats were needed to manufacture the dye. Each vat had a separate function. The leaves stripped of the indigo plant were first soaked in warm water in a vat, known as the fermenting or steeper vat for several hours. When the plants fermented, the liquid began to boil and bubble. Now the rotten leaves were taken out and the liquid drained into another vat that was placed just below the first vat. In the second vat, known as the beater vat, the solution was continuously stirred and beaten with paddles. When the liquid gradually turned green and then blue, lime water was added to the vat. Gradually, the indigo separated out in flakes. A muddy sediment settled at the bottom of the vat and a clear liquid rose to the surface. The liquid was drained off and the sediment, the indigo pulp, transferred to another vat known as the settling vat and then pressed and dried for sale. Figure 10 An indigo factory located near indigo fields Painting by William Simpson in 1863 Here we can observe a beta vat and a fermenting vat. Figure 11 Women usually carried the indigo plant to the vats. Figure 12 The vat beater The indigo worker here is standing with the paddle that was used to stir the solution in the vat. These workers had to remain in waist-deep water for over 8 hours to beat the indigo solution. Figure 13 The indigo is ready for sale. Here you can observe the last stage of the production. Workers stamping and cutting the indigo pulp that has been pressed and moulded. In the background, you can see a worker carrying away the blocks for drying. What does vat mean? A fermenting or storage vessel. Page 35 When the crop was delivered to the planter after the harvest, a new loan was given to the riot and the cycle started all over again. Peasants who were initially tempted by the loans soon realized how harsh the system was. The price they got for the indigo they produced was very low and the cycle of loans never ended. There were other problems too. The planters usually insisted that indigo be cultivated on the best soils in which peasants preferred to cultivate rice. Indigo, moreover, had deep roots and it exhausted the soil rapidly. After an indigo harvest, the land could not be sown with rice. The Blue Rebellion and After In March 1859, thousands of riots in Bengal refused to grow indigo. As the rebellion spread, riots refused to pay rents to the planters and attacked indigo factories. Armed with swords and spears, bows and arrows, women turned up to fight with pots, pans and kitchen implements. Those who worked for the planters 
were specially boycotted and the gomasthas agents of planters who came to collect rent were beaten up riots swore they would no longer take advances to sow indigo nor be bullied by the planters lathiyals the lathi wielding strong men maintained by the planters why did the indigo peasants decide that they would no longer remain silent what gave them the power to rebel clearly the indigo system was intensely oppressive but those who are oppressed do not always rise up in rebellion they do so only at times in 1859 the indigo riots felt that they had the support of the local zamindars and village headmen in their rebellion against the planters in many villages headmen who had been forced to sign indigo contracts mobilized the indigo peasants and fought pitched battles with the lathiyals in other places even the zamindars went around villages urging the riots to resist the planters these zamindars were unhappy with the increasing power of the planters and angry at being forced by the planters to give them land on long leases the indigo peasants also imagined that the british government would support them in their struggle against the planters after the revolt of 1857 the british government was particularly worried about the possibility of another popular rebellion when the news spread of a simmering revolt in the indigo districts the lieutenant governor toured the region in the winter of 1859 source 2 a song from an indigo producing village in moments of struggle people often sing songs to inspire each other and to build a sense of collective unity such songs give us a glimpse of their feelings during the indigo rebellion many such songs could be heard in the villages of lower bengal here is one such song the long lathis wielded by the planter of molahati now lie in a cluster the babus of kolkata have sailed down to see the great fight this time the riots are all ready they will no longer be beaten in silence they will no longer give up their life without fighting the lathiyals page 36 the riots saw the tour as a sign of government sympathy for their plight when in barasat the magistrate ashley eden issued a notice stating that riots would not be compelled to accept indigo contracts word went around that queen victoria had declared that indigo need not be sown eden was trying to placate the peasants and control an explosive situation but his action was read as support for the rebellion as the rebellion spread intellectuals from calcutta rushed to the indigo districts they wrote of the misery of the riots the tyranny of the planters and the horrors of the indigo system worried by the rebellion the government brought in the military to protect the planters from assault and set up the indigo commission to enquire into the system of indigo production the commission held the planters guilty and criticized them for the coercive methods they used with indigo cultivators it declared that indigo production was not profitable for riots the commission asked the riots to fulfill their existing contracts but also told them that they could refuse to produce indigo in future source 3 i would rather beg than so indigo hajji mulla an indigo cultivator of chandpur thana hardi was interviewed by the members of the indigo commission on tuesday 5 june 
This is what he said in answer to some of the questions. W.S. Seton Carr, President of the Indigo Commission. Are you now willing to sow indigo? And if not, on what fresh terms would you be willing to do it? Hadji Mullah. I am not willing to sow and I don't know that any fresh terms would satisfy me. Mr. Sale. Would you not be willing to sow at a rupee a bundle? Hadji Mullah. No, I would not. Rather than sow indigo, I will go to another country. I would rather beg than sow indigo. Indigo Commission Report, Volume 2, Minutes of Evidence, Page 67 Activity Imagine you are a witness giving evidence before the Indigo Commission. W.S. Seton Carr asks you, On what condition will riots grow indigo? What will your answer be? Page 37 After the revolt, indigo production collapsed in Bengal. But the planters now shifted their operation to Bihar. With the discovery of synthetic dyes in the late 19th century, their business was severely affected, but yet they managed to expand production. When Mahatma Gandhi returned from South Africa, a peasant from Bihar persuaded him to visit Champaran and see the plight of the indigo cultivators there. Mahatma Gandhi's Visit in 1970 marked the beginning of the Champaran movement against the indigo planters. Elsewhere, indigo making in the West Indies. In the early 18th century, a French missionary, Jean Baptiste Labat, travelled to the Caribbean islands and wrote extensively about the region. Published in one of his books, this image shows all the stages of indigo production in the French slave plantations of the region. You can see the slave workers putting the indigo plant into the settler vat on the left. Another worker is churning the liquid with a mechanical churner in a vat, second from right. Two workers are carrying the indigo pulp hung up in bags to be dried. In the foreground, Two others are mixing the indigo pulp to be put into moulds. The planter is at the centre of the picture, standing on the high ground, supervising the slave workers. Figure 14. Making indigo in a Caribbean slave plantation. Let's recall. 1. Match the following. Column 1. Riot. Mehel. Nij. Ryoti Column 2 Village Peasant Cultivation on riots' lands Cultivation on planters' own land Page 38 2. Fill in the blanks A. Growers of wood in Europe saw dash as a crop which would provide competition to their earnings. B. The demand for indigo increased in late 18th century Britain because of dash. C. The international demand for indigo was affected by the discovery of dash. D. The Champaran movement was against dash. Let's discuss. 3. Describe the main features of the permanent settlement. 4. How was the Mehelwari system different from the permanent settlement? 5. Give two problems which arose with the new Munro system of fixing revenue. 6. Why were riots reluctant to grow indigo? 7. What were the circumstances which led to the eventual collapse of the indigo production in Bengal? Let's do 8. Find out more about the Champaran movement and Mahatma Gandhi's role in it. 9. Look into the history of either tea or coffee plantations in India. See how the life of workers in these plantations was similar to or different from that of workers 
in indigo plantations. Let's imagine. Imagine a conversation between a planter and a peasant who is being forced to grow indigo. What reasons would the planter give to persuade the peasant? What problems would the peasant point out? Enact their conversation. The chapter 3 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Akash Ahuja Technical Coordinator Buddy Lang Lingdo Production Assistant Meenakshi Kukreti Producer Vandana Arimardan Presented by CIET NCERT New Delhi, India